recording this meeting. Okay, this is lecture 12 in high dimensional probability. And last class in this class, we're going through a little bit of a stretch of a background, which is a little boring maybe because it doesn't have immediate applications right now, just hands-on applications unlike before. But we need that. We will need it. Maybe, maybe I think this this class will be the last one, just kind of an, on a dry side, and then we'll have some some applications. Why do we do that? Why do we need that background? It's because when we work with random variables, we want to have a handle. We want to measure them in different ways. We want to say this run. What's a what's a measure of the spread of a random variable other than the variance, for example? How do we measure that the random variable is large overall, its values, its magnitude is large? And that's what we started to do last time, using the, the, um, the notion of the norm. So a norm on a vector space is, is a proxy of of the notion of length of the vector and i'll not repeat all these properties but the most important ones is that it should be homogeneous so if you multiply things like i don't know like like five times x for example then it should factor like five times x like that so the length of five times the vector is five times the length obviously and and also and this is probably the most important property the triangle inequality should hold. So the triangle inequality. And then a, a, a norm generally is this, and the space with that norm is, is called the, the, the norm space. Good. So we will now consider random variables as points in the norm space, and we'll put a norm on random variables. So we'll kind of measure the length of random variable. In this sense, this is useful because we can then think of random variables as little points in a space that kind of compactifies our, our thinking about them, makes them small and, and manageable in a sense. Specifically, um, for a random variable x, we can consider the, the moments, and the moments is like this, p, that's a p absolute moment. And that itself cannot be a norm because when you raise it to the power of p, uh, the homogeneity will not hold. In fact, the norm, if, if, if you declare that to be the norm, then um, you know you will have five to the p as opposed to five. So you need to take the, the p through it back. And that becomes indeed a norm. And this is called the LP norm. So this is a definition of the LP norm. For any P greater than one, it's a norm. And then um, the L infinity norm, at the end of that scale, if P grows larger, the L infinity norm is, is essentially the supremum of X. And when I, when I put S, it means essential, it means it was almost surely. So I can remove the sets of measure zero uh, before doing that. The LP norms increase. And as P goes to infinity, they actually converge to this sale to infinity norm. So it's a, the situation is like this L1 norm, L1 space. The space of all random variables with a one norm is bounded is finite, it's the largest one. L infinity is the smallest one. And, and there is the rest of them like this. If P is one, then L1 is just all random variables with finite expectation. And L2, well, L2 will be E of expectation of X squared. So that, that looks like variance, except we have to subtract the mean, of course. 
So L, L2 becomes a space of all random variables with finite variance. And L infinity at the end of the scale is the space of all random variables that are almost surely bounded. And the inclusion goes this way. If the, right, if boundedness implies variance, if variance implies mean. Good. I think that's we. Okay, that's that's what we did. That was last class. Any questions before we go on to this? Well, cool. okay. Uh, it seems to be Alexia Satine, but you, your headline is 12. Yeah, can you repeat this? I didn't catch you. Uh, this is Alexia Satine by the number, but mm. uh, there is 12 in headline. Ah, really? Is it 13? More detail. <gasps> uh, yeah, you know what? Maybe you're right. I don't know. I'll have to check. All right. Thank you. I'll we'll check carefully. They want you to have access. All these lectures are posted as well, and I want you to have access online of this. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. Anything else? Guys, you, everything is good? Good. <laughs> good. So I, I bet some of this you know, especially if you're not the third year student, but the fourth year, then masters, you, you know all P spaces. Okay, fine. Now I'll tell you something that you don't know. When you think when we think about the the this definition, this LP, the classical spaces. So go back to the beginning of the 20th century to Lebesgue, who, who developed measure theory with well, this very, very classical. You may ask yourself, how special is this form of the function that you take expectation of, of what? You raise it to the power P. So this function from X to X to the P, the, just a the polynomial, for how special it is. Um, if, I find, if, if I put any other function, will this be a norm? I don't know, sine of x, kind of exponentiation of x, something like that. And we want to do that because that, that may capture different ways of measuring how large random variable is. We have kind of our, our idea is to is for today is to develop different kind of kind of rulers to measure the the, the, the magnitude of random variables in different ways. So how can we do that? Can we do this beyond the LP, beyond just the, taking the power P? So for example. Something like this. Is this a norm? Well, for some function, maybe maybe x if you exponentiate x. Is this a norm? What do you think? If you just exponentiate x instead of taking this. No, like there's no linearity. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, there is no no homogeneity. Okay, yeah. So we'll have to take something like this, maybe, right? The inspired by just taking the uh, the piece power, and then afterwards taking the piece root. I can we can do something like that, right? First exponentiate and then take the log, just in this kind of metaphor. And that is still not a norm, unfortunately. If you, if you do it carefully, it's still not a norm. But we're not too far from truth. There is a little trick that can make any convex function, and in this case, the exponent is a convex function, exponential function is convex, uh, into a norm. Uh, and that's useful for us, and that we'll, we'll do today. This is called the, the notion of, of the norm space obtained this way is called Orlich. So it's a Polish mathematician, Orlich spaces. Okay. This is just more general function spaces than LP, and it's a mechanism. You you give me the convex function, and I'll return you the the norm that corresponds to that convex function and the space. So here's for the full disclosure. This is let me describe exactly the functions that are allowed here. Basically convex. So for any function, any any function basically. Let's say call it psi. 
on the positive axis. Let's call it an Orlich. function if it is convex increasing and uh, and um, starts off at zero so it converges to zero as x goes to zero and increases to infinity like this. So it needs to start off at zero and increase to infinity from here to there. And convex. Okay, so any, it's a pretty mild assumption. For example, x to the p is a valid choice, and which will eventually correspond to the LP space. But if we want to exponentiate, fine. Yeah, we can exponentiate. E to the X is not quite good because it doesn't start off at zero. So maybe I'll subtract one just to put it down and start at zero like this. And that will be fine too. Okay. And here's how we will define the LP space. Um, the, the, the Orlich space for a given Orlich function. Orlich function psi, the Orlich norm of a random variable. just denoted this way, sub psi. And here is what we do. We in so the temptation, our temptation would be to define it this way or something like that, expectation of psi of x. And then we know that psi is, well, psi is not linear, so how much need you will not hold. Okay, so now we'll resist that temptation and we will do the following. We'll take expectation of psi of let's say x divided by some number k and whenever we can make this let's say smaller than one then that number k will be the norm so it's the smallest number it's the smallest number for which this is less than let's say one it doesn't really matter for convenience one and the fact which is not trivial but could be proved not, not, not a not very difficult but not trivial fact that that it is indeed a norm so the triangle inequality holds and everything else holds on the Orlich space, which we define obviously as by including all random variables x, whose Orlich norm is finite. It's the most obvious way to define this. Okay, we'll give this example, the, the LP space, but is the formal definition clear? Just a formal statement, yeah? Perfect. So let's look at the LP space. Just make sure that if we do this function, x to the p, it will return us the LP space. And why? Okay, so we now look at x over k. We take raise it to the power p. We we look at the smallest p for which it is smaller than one. Okay, so I can move p to the other side. We take the square root, sorry, the pth root, obviously. pth root, and we'll get this. 
and the left side is obviously the LP norm. I just spelled out this, this definition for the LP norm and it looks like um, we have to look at this inequality and find the smallest K that satisfies it. Well, obviously the smallest K that satisfies it the, is, is actually the LP norm itself. And so, so in this case, the L psi will be just the LP norm. Good. Okay, so now we have a more general definition. We basically say, well, LP norms are fine, but there is nothing special about P or any, nothing special about raising it to the power P. We can take any convex function um, and adjust it to our uh, adjust it to our needs. For example, we can take this convex function E to the X minus one, let's say convex and increasing and and what do you think will happen so um l what do you think will is larger this space or lp this way or this way <laughs> Should think about it this way. We have if if something belongs to this whole side, it means that I can exponentiate random variables and it's still finite, something like that. Maybe it's more formally, it's like this. So you exponentiate random variable. You generally have big, big numbers by exponentiating, right? Generally exponentiate the values as you become huge and that is still integrable that is still has expectation that's a strong statement isn't it for the lp norm it says i just raise it to the power p and that is integrable but exponentiation give much much stronger much bigger numbers and so it's hard this is harder to achieve right and this is easier to achieve just just the feeling of it, right? And so this means that L psi is this way. It's a smaller space. It's harder to expect that the random variable after exponentiation would have expectation. So, and this is true, this can be proved. Um, and that is true too, of course. If the random variable is totally bounded, like almost surely bounded, then you can exponentiate it and take expectations bounded. So this is true. It's a beautiful thing happens here, actually. So we have this hierarchy, L1, L2, and so on and so forth converging to L infinity. And we would think that this hierarchy of the spaces will just converge to L infinity without the gap. And that is not true because at the, at the end of this hierarchy, when all of these LP spaces are exhausted, there is still an untrivial thing. There is, let's, for example, this L psi that captures something, some behavior from the variables that the LP spaces can never capture. This morally corresponds uh, to this fact that you know I was fascinated by it when, in the first courses when uh, you say is there a, is there a function that increases faster than any x than any polynomial let's say yes exponential okay is there a function that increases faster than any polynomial but slower than exponential strictly slower than any exponential yes there is such a function for example e to the square root of you know, e to the log x squared or something like that so th there is this hierarchy that always you can build something between, and that is the case here. Good.
Perfect. Any questions about the Orlich Orlich spaces? Yeah. So there was an idea in in our thinking, right? To in order to take like the the psi of x. Uh, no. What are we doing? So in in the first example with uh for in, in the page before we were talking about e to the power of x minus one and we took the um, expected value of that and then took a logarithm right and this mm -hmm. was bad so mm -hmm. for yes for e to the x minus one there is not a clear way to see why that would be bad and another question yeah. well, is there a difference between uh, like this right not, not logarithm but like inverse function of e to oh, the x inverse. minus one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, some still okay. I, I, yeah, I get it. So like, phi minus one expected value of phi of x. Why would why would this be not a norm, right? Yeah. So why would this be not a norm? In, in first thing first, and if it is, in some cases, does it correspond to Orlich space norm with sign mm -hmm, with the same? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I get it. Yeah, yeah. It's a very good question. I don't know. But I think it's not a norm. Let me think. Yeah, let's think together. I don't think it's a norm. If you take x, even if let's say, why is it not the norm if 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 phi of x is um, is e to the x? Ooh. Let's let's first not bother with one, but e to the x. Let's say so we have log expectation of e to the x. That's by the way, it's called the cumulative generating function. Um, it is. It looks from like the triangle inequality might fall. I'm not sure. Maybe not. Uh, but the homogeneity. I think this this thing is, can just be negative, right? And that's the problem for norm. Ah, okay. Um, all right. Let's do it this way. So then it is um, e to the x is all. And yeah. here for function zero, constant zero, we have one, right? Or, or something. What do we have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, for zero, we have one. So it's okay. So we have log log of log of one will be zero. Okay. So it violates this this one thing that the norm has to be non-negative. Non norm has to be positive for all positive for all non-zero functions. But that's I agree. But that is easy to avoid. This problem is not so hard to avoid usually. Um, I would rather. I'd be happier if it violated triangle inequality or or homogeneity or something like this, which I think. Yeah, so, so, so basically, my question was: um, is is it a norm for these Orlick functions? Because these conditions, like tending to zero and to infinity, are I mean, natural and convexity. We wish we have shown some inequalities in mm -hmm. the last lesson for convexity, and uh, I was surprised to see this more complicated definition. I thought the Intuitive approach would would be Intuitive. good enough. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think it's not a norm, <laughs> or it's very far from from the norm. Let's let's do this. Let's do it together. Okay. Let's have x. Anything like that. I, I, let's not subtract one just yet. Just let's think of this simple example first. I think it's it even violates homogeneity probably, and let's say x is plus or minus one. With probability one half each. Let's check it on the simplest example. So we have log of then expectation would be uh, no plus or minus one is probably a bad example. Maybe one or how about this zero or one with probability one half each. So it's Bernoulli random variable expectation. So this is expectation is. With probability one half, it takes value e to the zero, which is okay. I'll, I'll spell it out plus e to the one with probability one half each. And that 
Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would like to, so let, let's assume it is a norm. And let's say I want like alpha times x, just to check the homogeneity. So alpha x takes values zero and alpha. So I have to check this e to the alpha. So far so good, yeah? I'm just checking homogeneity for, for this thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And this is e to the zero obviously is one plus e to the alpha over two. And I don't think it's homogeneous. So it, it should be linear in alpha. Right. If the homogeneity holds, this, this, this thing should be linear in alpha. And it certainly is not linear in alpha because there is this one in our way. Um, so homogeneity breaks down. And, and I don't think there is a way to repair it without making it some more complicated move, right? If I, if I subtract one for, um, ah, you see, I see what you mean. If you subtract one, then maybe you say it. No, I don't think if you subtract one, it would help you. because then we're subtracting two. Yeah, so I think if we, we can repair it by subtracting one like this, but it, it doesn't repair homogeneity. You will have e to the zero minus one plus e to the alpha minus one over two. And this will be e to the alpha minus one over two, still not, hom still not um, homogeneous in alpha. So even getting homogeneity is, 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 a, is a problem. And I think triangle inequality will be a problem too. Okay, okay. We still don't, we, 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 we don't know how to prove this in, in that case in more, more in, other, uh, in other definition, but I get you, you pointed out that it's hard. So. No, no, okay. it's not hard. I, it's not, I mean, it's not immediately clear. Like I write this definition and everybody, oh yeah, of course it satisfies triangular quality. It's not gonna be that way. You have to, to work a little bit on, on this, but in like in, in half a page, you can prove it. I will not do that. It's, it's kind of boring, but it's, it's possible. But yeah, you have to trust me. I, I just don't wanna do it. So this one, we checked that this approach or modifications of this approach will not, which is much the most natural, I totally agree. That would be the most natural thing. But that does not define the norm, unfortunately. Um, what does define the norm is this thing. Yeah. But I will, I'll skip the proof. I'll not go into the proof of why exactly this is a norm. It's a little, little exercise, actually. Just do it like five lines you can do. Okay. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, that was my first reaction to this too. You know, why, why do we have to sweat through this if we just exponentially take logs? Done. Not true. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, guys. Now we have diff Now we have a tool. Now we have a kind of a, a general gauge or a ruler or lich spaces that, that we can measure the behavior, measure the magnitude of random variables in different ways. And this will be helpful for us. How? So now let's go back to the kind of the more probability statement. And, and let's, let's just recall the first inequality that we proved, which is Herbding's. Hurting's inequality. This is from lecture six, and it, and we proved it for symmetric Bernoulli random variables, which are uh, plus or minus ones with probability one half each, independent. So I I D independent and identically distributed. Okay. So what's the inequality? The inequality is kind of a central limit theorem. It, it says, okay, take their sum, normalize it so that uh, the variance gets, the mean is zero, obviously, uh, 
because each, each xi has mean zero, normalizes with the variance is one, and this is a proper way of normalization, one root n, now variance is one. And then the Hövding's inequality says that the tails of this random variable are approximately the same as in the, uh, what you would expect in the Gaussian case. So it's, it's a Gaussian tail, e to the minus t squared over two for n t. This is Hövding's a very powerful inequality. Yeah, re remember this, right? We we know that this this is the same tail as for the Gaussian, so the same holds if x i is your Gaussian with normal random variables, because then because then their normalized sum is also a normal random variable, and we know the Gaussian tail works. If you work through the proof, you will also see that it also works, for example, if you have uniform distribution. Normalized in the same way, maybe between minus one, I can remember, maybe between minus one and one is the right thing. It's a little exercise. So not just discrete distribution, also just minus one and one, but the uniform distribution, everything in between is also working. Same proof. Okay, so this at this point we should be wondering what is the biggest class of random variables for which it is uh, true. We can just do it individually when, whenever we want, just reproving it for any of it. Maybe there is just a class for which it is true, class of distributions. So what is the biggest class of distributions of x i is? For which Hövding's inequality holds. <clears throat> it's part of a more general question. What random variables concentrate near their mean? Symmetric Bernoulli does, uniform does, normal does, what else? Okay, let's figure it out. Well, if this holds, if this inequality holds, let's say for, for xi, then it holds for n equal one. Let's, let's just test it for n equal one. What does it say? It says that each random variable, individual random variable must have Gaussian tail. Maybe better. Like this. Okay, so it's it's saying that if we ever want Hövding's inequality to hold, if we want that result, then you can only look at random variables like this. You, the terms must satisfy, the terms themselves must satisfy uh, the Gauss, sub-Gaussian behavior of the tails. And we call them such excise. Sub-Gaussian random variables for the obvious reason that their, their tail behavior, the decay of the tail is as fast as Gaussian or maybe even better. So dominated by Gaussian. Okay, so the terms themselves must satisfy this. Okay, and then the uh, big statement that we'll prove not today, but the next time this is a little preview, so we will we'll show that this actually is a sufficient condition. So we'll prove that Hövding's inequality does hold for any sub-Gaussian terms. It's, a, it's necessary and sufficient condition. Any, any questions so far? Okay, so that's a big plan. If you want the sum of random variables, 
to be as good as Gaussian? Well, maybe if one, each random variable has to be as good as Gaussian, obviously. Um, and the non-trivial direction that we will prove is that whenever that holds, whenever you have random variables that individually are as good as Gaussian, and their sum is true, and it will come, it will concentrate. These random variables are called sub-Gaussian. Now, why we're talking about this is that in the last, I would say, 10, 15 years, this class of random variables, the sub-Gaussian random variables, gained more and more popularity as a as a kind of a default class for which you prove theorems and people will be happy in statistics, right? In statistics, everything is probably should be easy for, for normal distribution. You prove first for normal distribution, and then you wonder how do you generalize it, right? And what other distributions satisfy your, your theorem? Um, it is common understanding now that if you prove your theorems for sub-Gaussian distribution, that people will say, okay, Paper is good. It, it really is a good class, wide enough. It includes some discrete random variables, such as, well, for example, plus or minus one. It includes a standard normal random variable. Perfect. It includes some continuous random variables. And it is not such a bad thing to, it's, and it's not such an exotic thing here. So sub Gaussian random variables are. Um, let me just write that they're popular, but what they really mean is that this is the class for which you want to prove your theorems if you if you go to the data science and, and people will be happy. It's a pretty general class. So what we will do now, we if we want it, you know, today we, we could have proved. We could we could prove uh, Hövding's inequality for any sub-Gaussian, but because sub-Gaussian distributions are gained so much popularity because it is such a such a uh, general class, it makes a little bit sense to just stop, pause, and and um, and just look at it. Just look at what other properties does it, do they have? What are the sub-Gaussian random variables? So sub-Gaussian. Basically, it it's it says that they're as good as a normal distribution in many ways. What ways? And now let's let's check how normal distribution is good. What is it? What is what do we know about normal distribution? And later we will just transfer this to the entire sub Gaussian class, and we'll just for the rest of this course, we'll work just with sub-Gaussian random variables and proof theorems for them. So what do we know? What do we know about the standard distribution, standard normal distribution, basic question? All right, first, we know the tails already. This is what we proved maybe. I don't know, in one of the first classes, the Gaussian tail bound. Tail bound, it's like this. So these tails are small. Okay. Second, well, we just learned about LP spaces, so it makes sense to compute that, the moments. So let's say our random variable G is standard normal when I take G to the P and let's compute. So how do we compute that? That becomes, um, okay, it's a function of a random variable. So we compute it by integrating that function X to the P against the Gaussian density like this. Yeah, good. Okay, and let's say if, if P is even, so we don't have to worry about, well, if P is odd, obviously it's zero, okay? If P is one, three, five, uh, it should be zero by symmetry because plus will cancel with minus and we're done. But if P is even, 
then uh, the absolute value is not needed there. Actually, there was never absolute value in the first place, sorry, x to the p. And we can do integration by parts many times, as we usually do, like p times. Yeah, have you done this exercise ever? Like integration by parts, you just switch the trick. And every time you reduce the exponent here by um, by one or two, I can't remember, but maybe by one. Okay, if you work out this exercise by parts, then in the end you get you get something like this. Uh, you you get what is called p minus one double factorial, which is which is like the normal factorial only it skips. So in this case, it just skips two, four, and you just multiply one, three, five, seven, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's that's the result. It's a little bit inconvenient to think about this. So let's make a very crude bound like p, 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 and so on. Um, actually, like this, I think p, 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 replace everything by p, and there are p over two of them because we skip. So this is definitely smaller than p to the p over two. Yeah. So the LP norm then, the LP norm of the, of the normal is what? Is, p is even here. So I, I skip the absolute value. So it is smaller than, take that, take the pth root and you get p to the one half and that's root p. And that actually happens for any p greater than one. There we go. So the, the LP norms grow, but they grow graciously, like um, root p, not like exponentially fast, root p. Now we know the moments must grow. The moments are, sorry, the, the LP norms are increasing. So it should not be a big surprise for us that they grow. <laughs> but let me ask you, is it clear that these moments must grow to, oh, we got it, they grow to infinity. Was it clear in the first place that we should get something that grow, that, that increases to infinity and not stays bounded? Hmm? What do you think? even without this computation, that the LP norms of the normal distribution should, should increase to infinity and not just stay bounded. Let's assume the opposite. Let's assume they're bounded. What would be the disaster, disaster here? So if, if they're bounded, well, we know that their LP moment, the LP norms converge at the very end of the scale, there's L infinity, right? The LP norms converge to what? They converge to L infinity. If they stay bounded, then L infinity norm will be bounded, will be, will be finite. L infinity norm being finite means that the random variable is almost surely bounded. That means that the standard normal distribution, the standard normal random variable is almost surely bounded. It's like always between minus 100 and 100, no matter what, with probability one. And that's false, right? The normal distribution is not bounded. So a little remark is that they grow to infinity as they should. And that's because the L infinity norm is infinite since G is not bounded, almost surely. The density is everywhere. Yeah, good. Good. All right, let's let's throw in some some other facts that we know about normal distribution. Fact three, let's compute the moment generating function. 
And the moment generating function, by definition, it's this e to the lambda g for different lambda. You put, you plug in different lambda, you compute this. Let's see, one over root two pi. Okay, so how do you compute this? It's integral again, minus infinity to infinity. It's a function of the random variable. So I do this e to the lambda f. e to the x squared, uh, and yes, and then the density, one over root two pi, e to the minus x squared over two dx. Yeah. Okay, this is an easy integral. It's, we can combine two exponentials, will be a quadratic form, we change variables. It's a little exercise in, in calculus and, and we get e to the, lambda square over two as a result, do it yourself. Okay, fine. Or just bear with me, everything will fall into one picture. I'm just throwing in different facts about Gaussian and you'll be surprised what happens next. So let's look at the MGF of G squared. So it's e to the lambda g squared. This will be interesting because now things are not as are not as obvious as before. We're integrating lambda x squared against the Gaussian density, which is e to the minus x squared over two dx. And this exponents it's not clear anymore which one will win, right? If lambda is greater than one half, I think. If lambda is greater than one half, then the first exponential, this one, will grow faster than this one. And the integral will, will be infinity. So it is not true that we will have, um, that this will be always finite. And you can check, and I, I did it off, offline, this is my homework. This is the result minus two lambda. Lambda has to be obviously less than one half here. Also do it yourself. Okay, but what does that mean? That means in, in the analysis terms, that means that some Orlich function, some Orlich norm of the Gaussian random variable is bounded. What Orlich norm? We can now think of this as, as functional analysts and think, okay, Orlich function. What, what? This is a this is very close to this norm, e to the lambda, whatever, e to the x minus one. So how do we cook up the Orlich function? It is e to the x squared, and we need it to start from zero, so minus one. So again, Orlich function needs to just be convex, start off at zero and end at infinity and increasing. So that's, that's what it is. Okay, so for this Orlich function, for this Orlich function, let's see, let's compute the norm. So we have, let me go back here to the definition of Orlich norm. Right here. So we just need to find the smallest k that makes this smaller than one. E to the e to the psi, let's call it, let's call it psi two of x. E to the psi two of g over k needs to be smaller than one. So let's compute it. So this is e to the x and then show of x squared over of g squared over k squared minus one. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, let's see. So to connect this two, I'll put lambda to be Lambda has to be one over k squared, I believe. Yeah. Just 
just want this to be the same lambda is one over k squared and then get one over roots of one minus two over k squared this way minus one and they need it to be less than one okay so i think this will happen for example if we let k be two because it'll be one minus two over four one minus one half. yeah it should be okay So the result is that the Orlich norm of G, psi two norm of G is less than two. Okay, what's the significance of all this? It doesn't really matter what number we put there, but the situation is this, the LP norms they don't quite capture the, the story here because although they're finite, they increase. Root p. Okay. The L infinity norm also doesn't capture the story. It's just infinity because around the video, the, the normal is unbounded. So it doesn't capture. LP doesn't get, L infinity doesn't capture. And the psi2 norm does capture. So it's just maybe smaller than two. It's a constant. So that is what really captures the behavior of, of the normal random variable. These are, yeah, we're good. Any questions? But it, yeah, it's it's only for the second moments. So like for the statement, is that the same true for all other moments? Oh, you mean here? I see. You mean the g squared the, the, that moment, right? Uh yeah. Like uh, we yeah, have. Yeah. What happened? Have if we have, yeah. Yeah. What happened if we if we put x to the p, for example, or something like this? That's what you're thinking, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it is true. So let me first say that the second moment that x squared is natural. The, the, the exponent two is exactly natural for Gaussian because it mimics the, uh, it kind of reflects the, the, the behavior of the density. It's e to the minus x squared for the normal distribution. And so it makes sense to consider this Orlich norm and not e to the x to the p for normal. Because we make it juxta, we make it kind of fight uh, the fight between the growth of the scourge and the decay of the normal density. So that's why e to the x squared is actually is actually the thing that we want to look at first. But second, you're right. So we you know, what, what stops us from considering like a g, g cubed or g to the fourth, for example? We could do that, and we will immediately get, for example, for if we if we replace uh, two by four. Okay, don't try this down, but let's let's do this. Four here, and four here. What do you think happens? Nothing good happens, right? This is always infinite, because e to the x to the four grows faster than e to the minus x squared for any lambda. So this means that. Psi four, for example, is infinity automatically. So that doesn't capture anything. Um, and if instead of four, you get something less than two, then it does capture. Yes. Then it will be finite. And two will be the last point, the, the, the largest number for which you still have finiteness. So this is exactly the thing that captures the normal distribution, I believe. Good beginning. And uh, what did you mean when you said that uh, like LP norm doesn't catch this, uh, this behavior, but uh, but this procedure does? Yeah, actually, no. again. Okay. So what I mean by this is that each individual LP norm, like for example, GL4, for example, we just know it is finite. But it is finite for many other distributions that don't have this Gaussian uh, tail behavior. You just need to have the fourth moment. Finite. So, so each individual LP doesn't really capture the 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 I don't know this the spread of, of the normal distribution because it just says it's finite. The the psi two norm does capture just as I as we explained because if I put any other thing greater than two, it's already immediately infinity. So it's really like on the edge. 
But I cheated a little bit about this because the next fact that we will prove next time, and this is, this is really important, is that all these facts that we proved about tails, about normal distribution, or facts about normal distribution, tails and moments and moment generic function and this and that, it happens miraculously. It happens that they're all equivalent for any random variable, right? So they're telling us the same story. If instead of the normal distribution, I put anything else, then all these facts will become equivalent. For example, if I know, let me give an example. If I know that the psi2 norm of a random variable, this, this, this Orlich norm is, is finite, then I will can automatically in, deduce that the tails are sub-Gaussian like this. And the, the other way around too. If I know the tails are sub-Gaussian, this is true too. And I can do this equivalence among any, any set of properties here. So it is true that this collective behavior of the moments, that they grow like root p, it actually is equivalent to the tail behavior like this for any random variable. It's amazing, which is equivalent to, the, to this, which is equivalent to this. Everything is, is telling us the same story. And that we will do. Um, we will do it next time. We'll just say that all these properties are equivalent for any random variable. And that is what we call sub Gaussian. Okay, then we'll have a lot of tools how to study sub Gaussian random variables. We don't just have to resort to just tails. We can just say, okay, let me let me compute this. Okay, so the summary for today is that we introduced a class of random variables, so not, not formally so far, but we introduced a class of random variables that we call sub Gaussians. And we will prove that they have like many equivalent properties, the tail behavior, the growth of the moments, the moment generic function grows this way, uh, this Orlich norm is bounded, everything is equivalent. This class is general, this class is very popular now, and if you prove any theorem about just sub Gaussian random variables, people are happy usually. So you don't have to go beyond that, which we'll do next time. Good. Any questions? Good. Okay, guys, I will I will stay here. And if you need me, just yeah, talk to me. Uh, and otherwise, we'll see you on Friday. And don't forget the tea on Friday. We'll drink some tea. I will stop recording now.